Almost everyone I know thinks coffee is bad for you. It's going to raise your blood pressure. It's going to mess up your sleep. It's going to keep you stressed out. But here's the crazy part. Study after study shows that people who drink coffee regularly actually live longer. They have less cancer, less heart disease, and less Alzheimer's. The craziest part is that coffee isn't usually considered to be healthy. In fact, coffee consumption is more popular among smokers than non-smokers. Up to 86% of smokers are also coffee drinkers, whereas only 77% of non-smokers report drinking coffee. Siggies and coffee for breakfast with a baguette. The reason why coffee has benefits on longevity and major chronic diseases is mostly because of the polyphenolic compounds and chlorogenic acid that lower inflammation, improve mitochondrial function, support cellular autophagy, enhance stem cell function, increase stress resilience and adaptation, have epigenetic effects on DNA methylation, and protect the DNA and the genome. In this video, I'm going to break down what's really going on with coffee and your health. The good, the bad, the uncertain, and the stuff no one talks about. Timestamps below. Let's start with heart disease because coffee consumption is often associated with less heart disease. A 2024 massive umbrella review of 11 meta-analyses from 45,000 papers totaling up to 12 million individuals discovered that drinking up to 4 cups of coffee a day resulted in a 12% reduction in the risk of stroke. But heavy coffee drinking over 4 to 5 cups a day increased heart disease risk by 19%. Now, there aren't many randomized controlled trials on coffee consumption, but there are a few. So we can look at the effects of coffee on different aspects and different risk factors of heart disease. A 2000 randomized controlled trial saw that drinking one liter of paper filtered coffee for four weeks raised homocysteine from 8.1 micromoles per liter to 9.6, which is an increase of 1.5. Homocysteine levels above 10 are associated with increased risk of Alzheimer's and mortality. So it's not necessarily a good change. However, this effect was seen from consuming strong coffee in large amounts. The participants consumed 1100 milligrams of caffeine per day, which is about three to four times more than most people consume. Another 2001 randomized control trial saw that abstaining from filtered coffee reduced homocysteine by 1.08 micromoles per liter when the participants had been drinking on average four cups of coffee a day. So if you are struggling with homocysteine levels and you want to reduce them, you might want to keep your coffee intake to less than three cups a day. What about inflammation? Does coffee lower inflammation? A 2021 review of randomized controlled trials found inconsistent anti-inflammatory effects of coffee. So coffee's effects on heart disease and mortality are probably not due to reduced inflammation. However, a 2016 randomized controlled trial saw that coffee intake raised plasma antioxidant capacity in a dose-independent manner. There was no effect on chronic antioxidant status after 8 weeks, which means that coffee raises antioxidant status only acutely after consumption. This would support the idea that consuming several cups a day, like 2-3 to three cups a day, might increase antioxidant status throughout the day, but it doesn't have any long-term effects on your total antioxidant capacity. One consistent finding in clinical trials is that coffee, if prepared without a filter, raises cholesterol and other lipids. A 2020 meta-analysis of 12 randomized controlled trials discovered that over 3 cups of coffee a day seem to increase atherogenic lipids like LDL, total cholesterol, and triglycerides. So it's recommended to keep it below 3 cups a day if you're trying to manage your cholesterol. Coffee contains cholesterol-raising diterpenes like cafestol and cachviol, which can be removed by paper filters. If you want to manage your cholesterol and ApoB, then use paper-filtered coffee. However, these diterpenes like cafestol appear to have specific effects on visceral fat, which would explain the reduced risk of heart disease. A 2024 randomized controlled trial saw that 12 weeks of supplementing 6 mg of cafestol twice a day resulted in a 400 ml decrease in visceral fat and 1.8 kg weight loss compared to placebo. That's a very significant decrease that parallels a proper exercise and weight loss routine. However, the participants had quite a lot of visceral fat to begin with. The 400 milliliter decrease represented only a 5% decrease, which means they had up to 8 liters of visceral fat in the beginning. Those taking cafestol didn't see improved insulin sensitivity, blood sugar, blood pressure, or cholesterols, or cholesterol profile. Their GGT, a liver enzyme, did decrease by 15%, which reflects better liver health. Visceral fat is a risk factor and sign of metabolic syndrome that increases the risk of heart disease. So it might be that the diterpenes like cafestol in unfiltered coffee can reduce visceral fat mass. And it also looks like that you can supplement cafestol directly without consuming caffeine to see the reduction in visceral fat. When it comes to blood pressure, then coffee has a very interesting effect. It's commonly thought that coffee will raise blood pressure and that it increases the risk of hypertension. Yes, coffee acutely raises blood pressure, the same way exercise does. 
However, several meta-analyses of cohort studies find an inverse relationship between coffee intake and the risk of hypertension, meaning that people who drink moderate amounts of coffee have a lower prevalence of high blood pressure. The reason for that is that people who drink coffee regularly develop tolerance to the caffeine's effect on raising blood pressure. People who drink coffee less frequently still experience the rise in blood pressure because their body hasn't adapted to it. And exercise also raises blood pressure when you're exercising. But people who exercise regularly have lower blood pressure at baseline and they have a lower risk of hypertension. Whereas people who never exercise have a higher risk. So if you drink coffee regularly, you're not going to experience a rise in blood pressure, whereas those who drink it infrequently do experience the same rise in blood pressure. There's also individual differences in people's ability to tolerate caffeine. Individuals with two copies of the CYP1A21A allele are fast metabolizers of caffeine, which means they can drink coffee and still fall asleep at night. Individuals with the CYP1A21F allele are slow metabolizers. These individuals also get more cardiac complications and high blood pressure from caffeine. We'll come back to these genes later when we're talking about sleep. Let's move on with cancer. A new 2025 review found that coffee consumption is associated with a reduced risk of these cancers, skin and melanoma, liver, prostate, endometrial, breast, head and neck, and colorectal cancer. Cancers associated with increased risk included lung cancer, which might be because of smokers who drink coffee, meaning that although coffee appears to reduce overall cancer risk, it's not going to make up for smoking. Inconsistent or mixed results were seen with bladder cancer, central nervous system cancer, thyroid, mouth, esophageal, gastric cardia, kidney, ovarian, leukemia, myeloma, and lymphoma. Overall, coffee appears to reduce the risk of many cancers. Maybe there is an increased risk of lung cancer, but this might be because of smoking. Smokers are 15 to 30 times more likely to get lung cancer than non-smokers, and smokers are more likely to drink coffee than non-smokers. This doesn't prove anything, but it is a link. When it comes to neurodegenerative conditions like Alzheimer's, you see a same phenomenon. Consumption of 1 to 4 cups of coffee a day is associated with a reduced risk of Alzheimer's disease as shown by a 2023 meta-analysis of 11 studies. 1 to 2 cups a day was associated with a 32% lower risk, whereas 2 to 4 cups, 21% lower risk. However, over 4 cups a day was associated with a small 4% increased risk. Mechanistically speaking, coffee polyphenols might have neuroprotective effects and they can reduce the accumulation of beta amyloid in the brain that drives neurodegeneration. Caffeine does decrease cerebral blood flow, as shown by several studies. However, this is seen in non-habitual consumers, which means people who aren't regular coffee drinkers. It might be that there's a similar phenomenon as with blood pressure. Regular coffee drinkers don't see this effect, but we don't know that. There is currently a phase 3 clinical trial done in France looking at the effects of caffeine on Alzheimer's patients. We don't know the results of this trial yet, but prior research does suggest that caffeine could restore hippocampal neural function and mitigate early synaptic loss. One important thing to talk about is sleep, because caffeine can obviously prevent you from falling asleep. A 2023 meta-analysis found that caffeine consumption reduces total sleep time by 45 minutes and sleep efficiency by 7%. That's why it's recommended not to drink coffee any sooner than 9 hours before bed. One cup of coffee provides around 100 milligrams of caffeine and a lot of energy drinks and pre-workout supplements might contain even up to 200 milligrams per serving. So in that case, you want to avoid these even up to 13 hours before bed. However, everyone responds differently to caffeine. As we mentioned earlier, there are genetics that influence your metabolism of caffeine and how fast you metabolize it. For example, I can drink coffee for dinner and still fall asleep fine without any problems. Other people, they need to stop consuming caffeine after breakfast to not have an effect on their sleep. People who are slow metabolizers also get other negative side effects, like jitters, anxiety, and high blood pressure. If you are a slow metabolizer and want some of the benefits of coffee, then you could use cafestol or chlorogenic acid supplements, because these are responsible for some of the health benefits. If there were to be a takeaway from this video, then it would be that moderate coffee consumption doesn't appear to have any serious negative effects on your health. And it appears to have minor health benefits, especially for heart disease and cancer. A large 2017 umbrella review of over 200 meta-analyses, including hundreds of studies, concluded that the most benefits for health outcomes are seen at 3 to 4 cups of coffee a day, and that amount is more likely to be beneficial than harmful. Now, you don't have to start drinking coffee if you don't like it. You can also get some of these polyphenolic compounds from different vegetables, olive oil, nuts and seeds, tea, green tea, and some fruits and berries. 
But if you like coffee, then consumption of around 3-4 to four cups a day seems to be the sweet spot. Excessive caffeine consumption, excessive coffee consumption, over 4 cups a day might be harmful. If you want to know about the components of a healthy lifestyle that can help to extend your life, then check out my evidence-based longevity routine video next.